All right, why don't we get started? I'm sure some people will be joining over the next few minutes, but we got a few intro slides to run through and then hand it over to Hunter and Courtney for the main event. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we're excited to have CTUG up and running again. We're gonna be talking about data experience at Slalom and uh, Hunter and Courtney, our awesome panelists are gonna walk us through some, some cutting edge uh, work that they, they have been working on. Um, all right. So briefly our agenda tonight, we're just gonna talk about um, some housekeeping things for CTUG and then we'll dive into the main event. So um, as I mentioned, data experience at Slalom and um, will be will be one of the topics that Hunter and Courtney walk us through. And then they're gonna show us some, some really cool work that's being done in Tableau and Adobe in that intersection of like the creative aspect of technology and then data and analytics. So who we are. So Seattle Tableau User Group has been up and running for quite a while. Um, you know, group of business professionals, people focus on Tableau, people really excited about data and analytics. And it's just um, a place where people can collect and, and, and um, you know, build out their networks and be presented with awesome content and connections in the community to, um, yeah, hopefully become, you know, more well-rounded in Tableau. Uh, varied content. So we have all sorts of um, presentations in the works from panelists like we have today to um, collaborations and workshop events. And we're really catered to all levels and in, in industries across the Seattle market. So everyone from new Tableau Uners to seasoned um, Tableau Zen Masters, always welcome. Always hope that um, no matter what level of skill you are, you'll be able to grab something um, interesting from the event. So Slalom, Slalom is the sponsor of CTUG. And um, just a bit about us, uh, I am a consultant um, at Slalom in our Seattle market. And I'm excited to say that our two panelists tonight are also part of our Slalom team. So Slalom's a purpose-driven consulting firm. We are global. We have 30 somewhat offices all around the world. Um, and we have a strong partnership with Tableau and and are fortunate enough to work on some real exciting um, data and analytics projects. The Slalom Data and Analytics team has been the seven, ti seven time now Tableau Partner of the Year. Um, and our Seattle market is now up to 80 people. Also, I just want to plug that we're hiring um, for all levels from new college grads via our Consulting Foundations program. Um, we're looking at more seasoned consultants as well and senior leaders. So if you're interested in learning a little more, um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, below is my email address, and I'm happy to connect you with the recruiting team and talk a little bit more um, about who we are, what we do, what type of projects we work on, and kind of what our culture looks like as long. So who you are. So we have 98 companies represented on the RSVP list and um, mixed bag for, for people um, in terms of how many CTUG events they've attended and what their level of experience is. Um, I think this first time number percent or percentage is a little bit higher than, than normal. So that's awesome. Um, definitely trying to um, spread our reach around the Seattle market and, and encourage people to come for the first time and see what we're about. And, and hopefully they, they stick around. Um, level of experience. So we have you know a handful of people that are brand new to Tableau. Um, that big chunk is in that intermediate to advanced bucket. Um, and then I'm sure there are some Tableau data rock stars in the group as well. So um, going forward, we have upcoming CTUG meetings. So you know, as you all know, this is the first one in over a year now since COVID threw a wrench in our, our regular meetings. Um, we're targeting our next meeting for um, January and February, or between sometime in January and February. Um, we're going to give everyone a break over the holiday period as there's just so much going on. Um, keep in touch. There's uh, the user groups page where you can subscribe for updates and get emails um, when we have new meetings in the works and then our LinkedIn, um, Twitter and Facebook pages are great. And if you're ever interested in presenting or have an awesome idea that you would like us to discuss, just reach out, uh, feel free to shoot me an email or, or reach out on LinkedIn. Now to the main event. So as I mentioned, um, super excited about the content that has been put together tonight. We have two awesome people from Slalom, um, and coming together from slightly different backgrounds. So Hunter Barrett is 
part of our creative leadership and analytics team at Slom. And um, just going to go ahead and read his bio here. So Hunter is a hands-on creative focus on creating differentiated visual content for organizational leaders that want to better communicate their vision with data, information, and captivating stories. Hunter also curates the Data Artist website, which I highly recommend you check out. Has some really cool Tableau um, uh, work that he's posted on there. Um, and he is partnering with Courtney Marchese, who is out of our Hartford office. And she's an experienced design consultant, as well as an award-winning design professional and educator with over 10 years focus on the crossover between data viz and user experience design. She's had much of her research and case studies published in academic journals, and her first book, Information Design for the Common Good, is now available, and I highly recommend that you check it out. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Hunter and Courtney, and they're going to walk us through tonight's content. All right. Carl, can you give me a thumbs up so I know you can see my screen? Got it. Sweet. Um, so Carl, thanks for the intro. I'm, I'm super excited to be at this event because I've attended many CTUG events, but I don't think I've ever presented at one. So this is kind of like my dream come true. Uh, and I'm really excited to be presenting with Courtney because although I don't, I don't think I've been to every CTUG event, I've been enough to enough to say with confidence that I don't think we've ever had an experienced design professional join these conversations. Um, and so I think that's just an exciting uh, kind of shift in the way that we think about Tableau and understand everything that this software can do. So my hope is that um, as we make our th way through our content today, that uh, it'll kind of change the way you look at the software, um, not only from an analytics perspective, but also just from a broader uh, data experience per perspective, meaning um, the way that we all kind of encounter data and interpret data and engage with data um, day to day. Uh, so Courtney and I uh, are actually, we're both relatively new to slalom. Um, and we very quickly found each other kind of in the network of slalom, uh, slalom teams, because we both have this interest in the way that the worlds of data and information intersect with design. Um, and specifically visual and interactive design. Um, and she and I are putting together a, a charge and specifically a capability around data experience or DX at Slalom that's laser focused on how we can make data a delight in our day-to-day -day lives, right? So how can we use all the tools at our, our disposal, Tableau being, being uh, one of them, to create better experiences around BI, around reporting, or around any kind of content that's made that's either data or information uh, heavy. So what we're gonna do today is go through kind of the, the different branches of experience design and talk to you a little bit about how we're conceptualizing this space. Um, I'll also say, just as an aside, this is a really new kind of space and experience. So Courtney, like this is like fresh off, fresh off the press stuff that Courtney and I are thinking through and, and um, kind of learning about as, as, as we go. Um, but between the experience that I've had in creative direction within analytics and then Courtney's experience with um, kind of that intersection of, uh, of user experience and, and data and, and, and information, we're feeling really excited about the way that we're, we're kind of putting this together. So when we think about data experience and, and the capabilities that, that exist within it, we, there's kind of these two branches, right? One is about analytics and dashboards, which I think is super relevant to the folks that have, that have uh, joined this call. Um, it looks at you know, using Tableau and all of the features and functions that exist within that product to really um, leverage everything that we can to improve the visual and user experience design within a product like Tableau. I'm gonna cover some of that content and give uh, some tips and tricks around what I have used in my, my career, uh, frameworks that I've advocated for and used, um, as well as uh, some examples around what that's looked like. Um, when we move to the right-hand side, we're going to have Courtney take us through a little bit of the ways that Tableau has crossed her ra radar in experience design and some ways that, that she's using Tableau to kind of expedite the work that she's thinking about. Um, and the, the real headliner here is if you strategically, Tableau can improve data experiences. And Courtney and I are learning kind of every day that we're working through these things that that's really true and um, is... Uh, something that we're really excited to kind of share and, and talk about. So 
again, we're going to start with this left hand side. <clears throat> um, and I want to talk a little bit about this creative analytics methodology or CAM that I've been sculpting with a number of folks on our DNA teams. It breaks down into three basic uh, phases that look at planning dashboards, designing dashboards, and developing da dashboards. And methodologies like this one I've seen be really successful in my career, not only as I train up new co consultants, but also work with more tenured folks that have a lot of kind of, you know, the technical underpinnings of analytics down, like they, they understand the, the technologies, they understand how, how to use them, but they haven't always been asked to think um, creatively about the content that they're making. Um, and so what this methodology does is it lays out these three phases and helps people run through um, engagements either with um, their, their uh, it, it could be with like their boss, with their team, with an executive executive team. This is also very relevant to folks that work at Slalom, right? So we have consultants that work with stakeholders to plan, design, and develop dashboards. Um, and methodologies like this help them do that um, in, in kind of faster ways and repeatable ways. Um, what we're gonna do is I wanna, we're just going to look at part of this uh, framework today because there's a lot there. But the way that it works basically is each one of these steps, these 15 steps that that um, kind of lay out across these three um, phases here are focused on different things. So this first one, right, is, is like a, a project overview step. Um, it takes uh, folks through some best practices around gathering requirements, identifying stakeholders and users of the 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 dashboard. And what the framework can do is kind of identify some templates or guides to help people as they get started with that plan step. Um, as we move kind of down the line, there's a lot we can do to develop personas around not only stakeholders, but also users. And once again, working really hard with folks on our DNA teams to develop best practices around how to develop those personas um, and really create clear documentation around what stakeholders need from a strategic perspective and what the, what the business needs, but also around what users expect and will find useful. What we're gonna do today is look at step 14, which is at the very end of, of develop, which is kind of one of my favorite areas of, of this workflow. Um, and it focuses specifically on these seven visual polish principles. Now, these, again, is kind of a visual polish framework that I've seen um, work in, in different ways really well throughout my career and really provides a lot of guidance to what I would call kind of non-designers or, or analysts around where they should start in making their work uh, more differentiated, improved from both that visual design and user experience perspective. So what we're going to do is look at one example and kind of uh, I'm going to take you through these seven uh, principles, and then I'm going to kick it to Courtney to talk about that other branch of DX. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump into Figma here. Um, and I'm actually going to take you through a dashboard example that came from Rashad Aziz, who is a consultant with um, Slalom that works out of our Silicon Valley uh, office. And he shared with me this example recently, a dashboard around US car accidents. This is available on Rashad's uh, Tableau Public as well. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, but I was excited to kind of share, share his work and, and talk a little bit about what, what he does. Um, so this was a project that, that he did, and it was a dashboard that he took from, I think, a, a junior team member who was learning, learning t Tableau um, and really added a lot of uh, great components uh, that, that do a really good job of exemplifying how uh, a framework like those seven pr principles can up-level work, again, from visual and user experience design perspective. So if we consider the first dashboard on the top as our kind of uh, before dashboard and this dashboard on the bottom as the after dashboard, what I want to do is just guide us through a relatively quick but rigorous conversation around the changes that were made moving from the top to the bottom to improve the overall design of a visual like this. So down here, I have a set of slides that we're going to kind of zoom into and walk through. Um, and at the top here, we have our creative analytics header. Uh, mastering the intersection of data information and design will differentiate deliverables and uplevel our work. And so what we're going to do is start with that first principle around cl cl uh, clutter, which really focuses on removing things from a dashboard that we might, might not need. 
And so if we look at this dashboard again, this is our before uh, dashboard. We can see that we have some auxiliary text on the left side of this that adds some relatively straightforward or unneeded uh, explanations around what the, the visuals are to, to the right. Um, and there might be some, some uh, opportunity here to kind of take those out and declutter the, the view. And what we can see as we move to the right here, and if we consider kind of this first set, is the dashboard doesn't have a lot of text on it uh, beyond the, the visualizations them, themselves. And I think one thing I see a lot in uh, the work of, of analysts is uh, adding a lot of text to dashboards. Um, ultimately, what that means is using a lot of re real estate for explanations that can either be completely removed because if visualizations are, are well designed and laid out and, and labeled, oftentimes that kind of auxiliary text isn't uh, needed. There's also situations where you can hide text like that in a, in a tooltip or, or something of that nature to just clean up the view and help users really focus on, on the, the visuals that, that matter most. Um, if we think about context, one example that I like to look at here is, on this first dashboard is this lower visualization, this heat map on the bottom doesn't actually have a, an X axis, which is problematic, but as we kind of make adjustments in Tableau when we're building, sometimes that can be an easy thing to, to omit or, or forget about. Um, another thing that, that I notice here is there's a relationship between kind of this, this vertical bar histogram visualization and the, um, the heat map below it. Uh, and there's some mitness alignment uh, happening, which can, call, although we're offering all of the, the information, we're not really using um, alignment uh, and spacing to reinforce that, that relationship. And so from a context perspective, we want to make sure that those things are aligned. And we can see that as we move to our final draft here, um, that we've, we've made those corrections with that lower visualization. You'll also notice that there's some added elements that I think are really important context clues for users. So if we move back to the left in, in, our, in our before, you can see that these visualizations don't have titles. And um, if we move to the, the right here, we can see that um, Rashad added those. So we have a clear indication of what this visualization is looking at, being the accident trend for, for a day time aggregation. And then we have a day hour heat map below. The other thing that Rashad did here, which I thought was a really interesting thing, was added a tool tip. So if we hover over a cell within this heat map, users actually can access more uh, granular information um, and see even more information around uh, accidents when they happen and the conditions that might contribute to them. So again, from, from a context perspective, really adding some color around uh, the, the kind of summary data that we have in the visualization itself. Um, if we talk about layout, one of the things I noticed immediately is that while this first dashboard uses a grid to organize the space, what it's, really, uh, what it's really doing, and I often talk about layout in conjunction with white space. So I'll zoom out here to our kind of next, next uh, element down here. Um, but what you can see is that the grid that's set up on this original dashboard is creating a lot of unnecessary white space below. So if we consider the grid up here on this upper visual, we can see that it's a grid and it does add some benefit to organize our information that, that way. But what we can see is there's some kind of negative uh, consequences to, to this grid and that it's just not using space very well. So as we move to the right, what we can see is Rashad totally reimagined this grid and in so doing uh, used space a lot better. Now it doesn't mean that he abandoned white space entirely, but he applied it in more consistent ways um, and left areas of white space relief in places that were more intuitive uh, and more consistently applied. And so he adhered to this concept of a grid, which we can see on the top, but the, the, the distribution and size of white space on the lower visualization is a dramatic shift and improvement from the original uh, visualization. Color is another good one to look at here. Now, when we look at this uh, and we consider this uh, the, kind of the, the color application we, ha we have here, those of us who know Tableau well, which I think is, is all of us, we'll see that these are Tableau defaults. Now, the, the colors that Tableau has decided to 
um, provide as a default are effective in accessibility and making sure that our quick analytics have kind of clear distinction between the measures or dimensions that we might be looking at. Um, however, there's a lot of opportunity within Tableau to make changes, customize, um, and to just to just kind of like make visuals feel a little bit more up to date or uh, branded. And what we can see is that Rashad took advantage of that by kind of incorporating this more subtle kind of dark teal blue color. Um, you'll also notice that there's only one color apparent here, right? And by using a gradient, he was able to highlight the things that matter most without distracting users by an overuse of color. Um, as we think about font, there are some really straightforward uh, changes that, that were made here. In this original dashboard, we can see that someone was thinking about the size and styling, and in this case, color of font, and the way that they could kind of pull those levers to create contrast and highlight what matters most. Um, but Rashad did a really nice job of applying a custom, in this case, um, a, a custom slalom font to uh, the, the, the dashboard. And what we see is he created a more consistent hierarchy of information that helps users with those visual clues around how to move through, through a visualization. So that, that top uh, set of text is gonna be kind of the largest, it's gonna be bolded. And then as we move down to the visualization uh, headers, we have some styling around, um, you know, bold, bolding the, those titles, but making them smaller than, than the title. And again, that's a visual clue to, to users. And then the text that's within each of the visuals as well is even more um, kind of small and subtle. Um, when it comes to flair, we're really thinking about kind of visual communication and the ways that we can create differentiation in our work. Um, one of the things that we see here, again, similar to, to the color as well as the font, is a lot of Tableau defaults. Um, and what we can see that, that, that Rashad did specifically is moving away from a lot of conventional visualizations. In this case, he kept this line chart, which I think is great. Uh, but he, added, he adds a lot of visual interest by including these nodes to the upper left. Um, that not only hold some of that kind of key performance indicator or KPI data, uh, but also connects those with the, the visualizations that provide more, more detail around those. So um, I know that was a quick review. We have a lot of great uh, material and uh, resources for not only our consultants, but things that we share externally as well that can help people as they think through where to start um, in improving their designs. Um, with that, I'm going to hit it over to Courtney. Um, again, that was a review of kind of what that analytics and dashboard uh, conversation looks like when we think about data experiences and making dashboards and the experience around dashboards better. Um, but I'm excited for you to hear more from Courtney around um, the way that Tableau has kind of hit her, her radar and changed the way that she's, she's thought about the user experience design. Thank you, Hunter. All right. Are you seeing it? Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So from the interactive side of things and the experience des design side, um, Tableau has played an important role in um, the way I look at data. So I come from a higher ed and education background. So I'm always looking for um, new ways to explain information to people and help contextualize information. So um, through my work, Tableau has really helped um, provide some data accuracy to my the experiences that I create. So just to familiarize in case um, you are not familiar with the experience design process, there's a lot of similarities to what Hunter presented in the data and analytics process. Um, in XD, we focus on understanding the context for existence. Um, so really kind of focusing on um, the user research, interviews, competitive research, and creating some artifacts like personas, user stories, and storyboards. 
Um, those user stories in the storyboards are hugely helpful, especially with um, data driven stories, because it helps us kind of um, pace the information and decide, you know, what is what is the storytelling piece of um, what we're doing with data and interaction? Um, with prototyping, um, we wanna make sure that there's a nice balance between it being very user-centric and providing some value to the user and also addressing business needs. So um, considering navigation and transitions, um, you can start moving those uh, storyboards that you develop early on and developing out some wireframes and developing some design specs and systems to help make a stronger um, visual and interactive concept. And then finally, um, in testing, um, I like to use a nice balance of qualitative and quantitative methods to help validate my designs. So um, testing sessions, surveys, and collecting user analytics all kind of help in understanding um, how well the interface is working for the user and meeting those business objectives. So that all those testing sessions give some nice tangible feedback that can be fed right back to the definition phase and, and work towards future iterations. So the complement to some of what um, Hunter brought up are some of these human-centered experience design principles. So um, a really strong human-centered experience design is going to be useful, functional, credible, accessible, desirable, valuable, and engaging. So you can see that there's a lot of overlap between um, the expectations of a good um, experience design as well as a data and analytics experience. So all these things when they're packaged together really nicely um, can create some consistency through thoughtful visuals and interactive systems. So a lot of what I will do in my client work is to put together these comprehensive systems and whether that means um, creating templates or creating um, like a series of transitions or types of visuals that we're gonna use, iconography, all of those things I like to build and make custom and create that seamless experience from start to finish. Um, so then how Hunter and I came to work together, um, I had been working a little bit in Tableau. I assure you that I am probably the weakest Tableau user in this group, um, but I was using it as a tool to better understand data and then do something, um, something creative with it through Adobe software. So um, I'd say the biggest trial of this was um, I teach at Quinnipiac University, home of the Quinnipiac poll and their polling releases, their political polls um, are notoriously just this like plain text document. And I was so curious what would happen if we contextualized some of that and looked at some of the demographic breakdowns and look at categorize things by issue. And so that was really like my first real deep dive into Tableau, but all of those outputs I brought into Adobe because that was kind of my safety net and where I, I felt most comfortable with manipulating and adding a little more um, design sense to it. So when Hunter and I started working together, um, so we have these little joint training sessions between the two of us and Hunter helped me learn how to make some, some pretty basic, but complex, rich little um, data pieces in Tableau. And we would then take that output and bring it into Adobe and start playing with some really kind of interesting shapes and placements and layering effects that, um, although may be possible in Tableau, are 
are actually just a few clicks when you export it and bring it into Adobe. So um, the, the transition between the two programs is actually um, quite seamless and um, surprisingly easy. So starting with the use as our building blocks, um, we started making these really cool layered um, circles. So um, excellent data experiences depend on the user's ability to both engage with the data and make sure that it's intuitive and enjoyable. So that has that kind of um, user experience part incorporated. And then it also needs to be something that a user is willing to provide data to, to further personalize the experience. So um, with personalized experiences comes the, a lot of new business opportunities like increasing loyalty and engagement and further tailoring content to a user's needs and preferences. And of course, um, with some of that loyalty and engagement comes hopefully some new users as well. So if we look at the circle here representing a year's worth of data, um, we can think of this as a year-end review from a music streaming platform. It can be anything really <laughs> data related for a year. Um, and with this as a starting point, when you're working in Adobe, it gives you a lot of freedom for exporting different file types. So you can export and do things with animation. Um, you can do things with interactivity and working in Figma to incorporate into um, different interactive prototypes and really start putting together these uh, data experiences that are both compelling and insightful. Um, so then if we look at, you know, once you make these data visuals and contextualize them into an application with animation and motion, um, subscribers can view a curated data experiences about their data input. And this is how they start to engage with things. So which artists did I listen to the most? What type of music did I stream most frequently? And then based on some of that information, you can start branching out to other opportunities. So like what other artists are similar to the ones that I prefer? Um, and then you also have the business side of things with some of those insights in mind, you can start building in um, subscriber interests and preferences. So um, thinking about revenue driving entertainment partnerships. So based on the data they collect about your music interests, it can suggest some uh, concerts that you might like in your area. You can think of this as like a partnership with a, a Ticketmaster or Live Nation type of thing um, with these nice little um, dialogues that you can have with your data. So, and Hunter's gonna join me to, to get through these last two. Um, but when users are provided with an enjoyable data consumption opportunity and some intuitive ways to provide more data and give more feedback, um, you can really start to build a pretty, um, a pretty nice data experience. So starting on the left side, so, so data-driven content can tell the baseline usage and start that story with the user. So um, just that preliminary data collection of this is your year in review type of thing. Um, the user, this is kind of when you have to hook the user, when they start gleaning new insights and information and reflect on some of their unique data inputs, um, they can start to, um, start to really kind of interact with their data. So the service or product provides the user with the data experience, 
and then the user reciprocates by providing more data to fuel the process. So Hunter, if you want to take the right side. Yeah, so, so as that occurs, um, you, you know, we, we all know that organizations want to need data from us, right? So if we're on Netflix and we watch something all the way through, or if we add something to our list, or within Spotify, if we like a song or add it to a playlist or share it, right? Like there's there's kind of these data inputs that are that are that are happening all the time as we engage with these systems. Um, and our our data experience really depends, like improving that experience depends on our engagement with a system like that. Um, and so you can see as we move kind of to the right side of the screen, right? If we expect people to actively engage with providing preferences, interests, and increased data around how their experience has been or what they want to do, um, the left side really has to be compelling and really has to give them a reason to engage, right? Um, and then as, and as people do that, if we give them that reason, um, and we help them, you know, reach insights through this highly differentiated, interesting content, data-driven content that's kind of meeting them where they are and, and bringing them into the system. What then happens is you can create even more or different or updated differentiated data-driven concepts. And then it feeds back into that loop of con con consumption. Um, one of the things that I think is important to mention here is like what, what we're looking at on this slide. And again, this goes back to some of my earlier comments around how Courtney and I are very much um, knocking this around still, right? Like this kind of represents the thinking that we're doing around what it means to improve data experiences. Um, but it's like, this is, this is very like kind of fluid and, and kind of fresh off the presses of our minds. But based on the experiences that we have and the natural interests that she and I have and have discovered together and working together, we've, we've asked this question a lot. Courtney and I like making like cool things to look at, right? Um, Carl mentioned, I have this like website that I maintain and run. And luckily it's not a black hole of money because I sell some posters now and then. Um, but it just kind of like represents this repository of our portfolio of things that I just like making because they're like beautiful and interesting and I get to learn things and I like sharing things that I'm learning with my friends and family or people that follow me on Instagram, right? Um, and one of the really important things to stop and think about is, okay, so like beauty for beauty's sake is fine, but like, what does it do? And Courtney, Courtney and I have been having this conversation, right? Because we both love making like pretty cool, beautiful things. But it's like, okay, so to what end? Like, what, like why are we doing the, those things? And this slide in a really important way answers that question because compelling data-driven content that helps people engage, that helps people care, that helps people see things they didn't see, that helps people gain insights that they may not have had or may have overlooked, it's the glue that keeps a data experience together, right? Because if that's not being provided, right? If we're not meeting, if, if, if organizations and companies aren't meeting people where they are in the way that they're telling their data story, right? They're not going to get, they can't expect to get a good return of data from their subscribers or their users or their audience, right? So. When we think about this wheel and this figure eight and the importance of keeping it going, right? Really high quality differentiated content is the glue that keeps it together, right? It's kind of the heartbeat of the, this thing. And what I think is really exciting as we look at the, at the broad landscape of technology um, is different kind of collections of technology or, or teaming up of different technologies are going to help us get there in new ways. And, and what Courtney and I have discovered over the last couple of months in our time at Slalom has been that the Tableau Adobe combination is a really interesting one that can support data experiences like this. Um, and so as we work through these concepts and begin to look for use cases and applications of, of this work, 
Um, it'll be really interesting and exciting to see how it's received, how it lands, and to understand the business case that it makes. Um, that's a really exciting thing for me personally, because again, like I have this genuine interest like in my gut around making data beautiful and interesting and accessible and understandable and all of that stuff. Um, but this really starts to tip tippy toe toward that place where we're making a business case for that, right? And we're understanding why it's why it's valuable. It's not just like beauty for the sake of beauty. Um, but it's beauty that really improves the user and human experience, which is important. Um, and so I, I think it's exciting that Tableau is part of that charge and that we've identified Tableau as part of this workflow. Um, and although it's only a, like, you know, a small part of it when we think about like the research and then kind of the queuing up of data, it's a really important part, right? Because to Courtney's point, she's been able to use uh, Tableau to kind of sculpt that score story, to explore the data, to do some quick analytics. And then, and Tableau would be useful even just in that capacity, but it gets even better when you can start to use the product and some of the design features and functions in it to queue up a work stream in a, a robust tool like uh, Adobe. And by bridging that gap, once you're, once you're in Adobe, like all the doors are busted open in terms of what you can do. And Courtney mentioned some of that in terms of like animation and layering and um, just all, all sorts of embedding that, that you can do within the, the Adobe suite. So that that's kind of like how I see this slide and why I think it's an exciting thing. Um, Courtney, can you move to the next slide as well? Because I think we have one more. And to just put like a really fine point on this, right? So Courtney and I have talked about data experience today and the when kind of what it means to us. Um, and you know, we we as a group and me as an individual, right, think a lot about data and analytics. And from a data experience capability and discipline perspective, there's a lot of good to be applied to the work that all of us are doing every day, right? Within TWBX files and within our Tableau server environments, right? Like we can leverage a lot of the sensibility to make our work better, stickier, and a better experience for the people that are consuming it. Um, and then as we move to the right-hand side, right? I think Slalom is, is, uh, has been a really good environment for both Courtney and myself to think about how these this technology stack um, can really change the way that we understand the building of content like this and understanding how it can support organizations and our customers in reaching their goals um, and, and engaging with their, their people. So Courtney, I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to say on, on this last one. No, just kind of one thing to point out too is um, Adobe, particularly Illustrator, now has capabilities for doing data viz work and information graphics. And it falls far short of what Tableau can do. So uh, we need Tableau to, to make to make things um, as powerful as they can be. Um, so it's a it's a really exciting uh, transition between the two programs. So super happy that I have Hunter to help me on that journey. <laughs> Likewise, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I think now um, we're going to open it up to a Q&A. Car Carl, I don't know if you want to like take the MC reins for me. I can put myself on mute because you know I've been talking a lot. But is there no. is there yeah. anything else you want to want to say or do before we jump into some questions from folks? Nothing on my end. Nope. Yeah, we covered everything that I needed to cover earlier. Let's just open it up and uh, yeah, see what questions folks have and um, go from there. Very good. I got a question for you, Hunter. Sure. I was having a discussion with my client today and we were talking about the balance of investing so much time and effort into like beautifying Tableau dashboards as opposed to the quick and dirty approach of just getting information accessible. Sure. How do you approach that, right? Like how, how do you think about finding that balance? And maybe there's just two different trajectories for different use cases, but can you just talk a little bit about like how you would approach something like that? 
Sure. So I, I have long said, and there might be like, I know there's at least one person on this call who's heard me say this before. <laughs> there may be more, but when it comes to Tableau, like I see Tableau as a product that can do well now with Courtney in my life, I see it as a product that can do three things, but I used to say that Tableau was a product that could do two things. One was like quick analytic insights that help people see data, explore data, come to conclusions about data and prepare themselves for a decision they have to make or a presentation they have to give or whatever. The other thing that Tableau does, the second thing is that it's a content creator, right? Where you're, you're creating, um, you, you're, you're creating like curated data experiences, right? That uh, will pay dividends if you put the time and investment into them, right? And I've seen this over and over again in my, my work, uh, probably similar to the work that you've done, Carl, right? Where like you go into an organization and they don't necessarily have that clarity of thought around, well, Tableau can, can help us do both, right? Like we don't, have to, we don't have to make a polished up dashboard for everything. Um, and then likewise, we don't have to make the sea of mediocre reports or the sea of just sheets, right? Within Tableau that outnumber our workforce, right? And they aren't really used and no one really knows what they are. And there's a lot of kind of repetition or, or even duplication across content, right? Um, and so I think, I think that's like, that's where like the, the sensibility changes is like when, with your customer, when it comes to their use of Tableau, are they trying? Are they trying to curate a data experience for people? Um, are they trying to set up a self-service environment where people can explore data? Tableau can help do both of those things. More likely than not, they should be doing both of those things, but they're different use cases and they require a different lens because the use case is so different, right? What I have seen work really well at organizations is when, when an organization has like a set of reports. So they have like the 10 dashboards that provide a baseline of information and kind of like a home pay or a, like a home base or a launch pad or whatever you want to call it of like standard baseline reporting, right? And they maintain them and they treat them like products. And they, they publish them to Tableau server and every morning the, you know, 300 people on the sales team are logging in to get their priorities for the week and to understand how to do their jobs, right? And that's what I mean by pay div pays dividends to design those well, because your audience is really big and you should treat it like a product because it's behavior, like it, like it quacks like a product and it waddles like a product, like it's a product, right? Um, it's not a custom built app right, in CSS or HTML or whatever, whatever other people, whatever people use to build that stuff, but it's, it's, it's functioning like a product, right? That's different though, than uh, the sales director wanting to go in in preparation for a board meeting and saying, hey, I need to like, I need to dig into this to better understand uh, the performance of my team or the performance of this specific measure or of this part of the, the, the business. Does that make sense? hundred percent. Yeah. Right. I think it's easy to blend those two together. And I oh, think okay. like differentiating them and finding that split is really important that I can yeah. see that, that would work well. Yeah. And that gets it like, like, uh, that's to me, that's a big part of data strategy, right? Like, like data strategy deals with making those distinctions and helping, helping leader, helping organization leaders understand what Tableau can do. Um, and like all the things that it can do. Because if you're not thinking that way, you're good. Like you're, you're just going to end up with a lot of content. That's like, it's like all roads lead to just like massive amounts of content, just like mountains of reports and no one even knows what they do. Yeah. I've seen that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That adds a lot of clarity there. If anyone has any questions, feel free to use, I think it's the Q and a function on the bottom. I got a few more in my back pocket. I could keep Hunter and Courtney going all night, but uh, I would love to hear from you guys too. Hunter, I got another one for you here. So sure. the seven polished principles that you talked about, at what point in the development process are those top of mind? Is that something that really just comes together at the end after you have like your nuts and bolts finished? Or is that something that you're trying to get ahead of? And as you're drafting your individual worksheets, you're kind of thinking through those. So I actually think that some of the polished principles can be applied upwards of the design phase. So I showed that like kind of that three-tiered approach. Um, and I think that good, 
dashboard builders will have some principles around like context and uh, layout in mind upstream of opening that TWBX file and connecting to data, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of kind of thing, there's a lot of um, things that, that I believe in um, when it comes to visual communication and casting visions around dashboards and, and driving clarity with, with organizations that might not be used to visual analytics, right? You can, you can, you can drive a lot of value with drawing and, um, and like the visual communication process of that. And those things require you to think about layout mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of how I shared them today, I think it's important that you return to those at the end and say, Am I am I ensuring that my dashboard is kind of polished up the way that it needs to be? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we have like a, a checklist that that I, Courtney and I put together um, that is kind of designed to say, look, if you have a half an hour to improve the look and feel of your dashboard, to take it from you know a C plus to an A minus, what are like what are the things you should be thinking about, and what are some changes that you can make? Um, to to improve the visual and user experience design. So I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's like certain 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 uh, principles kind of belong upstream or can have relevance upstream, but they certainly all are relevant as you get as you move toward a final product. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. Got a couple questions in here. Um, Eric, let's see. What is the process of getting data visits out of Tableau and into Adobe look like? Oh, it's a fun little process. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's actually it's actually pretty easy. It's more um, a matter of formatting it correctly on the Tableau side of things um, to make the Adobe part as easy as it can and should be. Um, but if you are not familiar with Illustrator, it works with all vector graphics. And so you need to um, export from Tableau in a vector format that you can open um, within Illustrator. And then it's actually fully editable once you bring it into Illustrator. So um, from there, you can you can begin to break it apart and manipulate it in all the fun oh. ways. <laughs> I'll also say too, that that process, so Courtney keeps saying how, how like simple it is. It wasn't so pretty when we were, when we were doing it initially. Um, yeah. And we thought a little bit about whether or not we wanted to do a technical demo on this, but like, because it's so fresh for both of us and we're still getting familiar with the best way to do it, um, like all of that's still very, like very fluid. It may be something that Courtney and I like write a white paper on or do another um, like webinar on it or, or something like that to kind of show that that workflow. But like, we're definitely not ready for that right now. <laughs> and certainly, certainly not in an, in an hour talk because I think our, our numbers may have gone down had, had, had we tried. <laughs> <laughs> Is this on um, Tableau and Adobe's radar? Do you guys know like that intersection between the two tools? I am not sure, and um, I haven't seen a lot of work that has been playing with Tableau outputs in Adobe. And when I had initially started using that process with some of my past work, um, it was a little bit by accident, a little bit just lucky. And then as I kind of kept doing that, I would find um, different ways to kind of minimize the amount of artifacts and stuff you get in Illustrator and just kind of um, always looking to reduce the number of clicks I have to take to get something done. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it has taken a bit and there's always ways to improve it. And then Adobe has an update or Tableau has an update and then like you have to start all over. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. uh, I wonder in the future if there will be like a very seamless way that these two tools play play together. Oh, it would be brilliant because <laughs> I mean, yeah, um, it's fairly seamless right now. But if they actually made the conscious effort to um, streamline it even more, um, it'd be pretty awesome. 
Absolutely. Next question here. Um, Joe says, seeing little previews of your uh, in your individual non-solemn works earlier in the presentation, how did each of you develop your unique art styles? I found my private projects tend to reflect my company design principles. Mm. Courtney, you go first. Oh gosh, okay. see, <laughs> <laughs> you go. Yeah, um, well, so prior to, prior to slalom, like I said earlier, I. I came from an academic background. So I was a full-time design professor for 11 years and um, started a design agency at the school that I was teaching at and stuff. So I feel like I had a lot of opportunities to work on a lot of different projects and my brain is just wired to want to explain things. Um, so I think it's a lot of studying diagrams, maps. I'm just very influenced by like user manuals and instructions, just any of that kind of stuff, truly. Um, also um, like learning new languages and and stuff like that too. Like I was really into um, Rosetta Stone when it first came out and stuff. So like all of those different techniques of helping people learn, whether it's in an interactive format or, or outside of that, um, I think a lot of that style has just sort of evolved from, from that. I don't know. One of the things that comes to mind for me, uh, and I actually appreciate this question being asked because I think I just learned something about myself, which is great, <laughs> is we live in this like hyper digital world, right? Um, and I have done a lot of digital art, kind of like graphic design type work. Um, obviously within Adobe I, or within Adobe and Tableau, I've always like, been really interested in kind of bending and twisting those tools to see what they can do. But um, there's something about being a hands-on like maker of things that really impacts the way you use digital tools. So, um, and by hands-on, I mean literally hands-on, right? So like studio art trickles into digital expression. Um, and Courtney, I don't know, I see you nodding. I don't know if this, this isn't a conversation that we've had, but I'd love to have a conversation with you about this. We've never talked about it. But like, I find that like oil painting, watercolors, like I have a loom set up in my living room right now because I'm doing some like, like uh, data fiber weaving, right? Like all of those things end up influencing the way that I use digital mediums um, and without them, I think I would be more subject to the conventions that exist within those tools and be more influenced by what I see other people doing as opposed to creating like uh, original or, or unique expression of what I wanna do in digital tools. Like there's something about a digital tool that is inherently less original because it's set up to do something. Like digital tools are designed to keep people on track, but it's like, mm -hmm. who made, like whose track is that, right? So they're there's something- They're designed for perfection. Go, yeah, yeah go, go ahead. No, they're designed for perfection. Right. And we should be messing up. Yeah. And then, so there's, I think the answer, my answer to that question is like something about studio art that will make you like a more original thinker and doer. And that will naturally trickle into the creative expression of, of like digital mediums or like digital content. Yeah. And I think in some ways, just to like cap that off, I think that's like, that's what creative leaders should can and should be doing um, because that's some like studio art is something that's overlooked and inherently undervalued, particularly in technology. And there's a really important link between them that most people just don't acknowledge. Yeah, and actually this like 
I'm sorry, I'm going to take over Carl's MC position. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it leads really well into, I'm very excited by anonymous attendees question. <laughs> Um, because this is like this is my uphill battle on on the daily, and I'm sure it is for for you guys as well. Um, so, what would be your advice for someone who works at a company that values speed of projects and thinks of well-designed data products as a nice to have or an afterthought? Um, I have found um, and. Of course, I'm, I'm coming from a research background as, as well, but the power of research to ground anything that you're doing in like, no, actually a well-designed product can do this in this, in this measurable way that is going to meet your needs and goals in a way that the quick and dirty way is just not going to, that's that's the short-term solution. And I think there is a value in short-term solutions, but if you're looking for something that is both sustainable and has longevity to it, research has to be part of that process. And having an idea at the beginning, what you want to measure and what success looks like for a certain project. So, um, what type of engagement are you looking for with a uh, particular data project? Um, and I mean, the more evidence you can present, the more support you'll have to um, make some really creative pieces. It pays dividends. Oh yeah. People just don't see, people just don't see it unless to Courtney's point, it's presented in a way that's well re researched and supported. Mm -hmm. I think it circles back well to like the split that you mentioned earlier, Hunter. Like there are times and places where speed is absolutely the best best route. But for that suite of dashboards built for your executive team, where it's you know leveraged hundreds of times a day, that night those nice to haves are really critical. Yeah. We're uh, four minutes over. Um, that was an awesome meeting. Thank you so much, Courtney. Thank you so much, Hunter. Um, really cool content. Thank you everyone for attending. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, I think there was one last thing in here. Alex mentioned, are you able to share that 30 minute design improvement checklist? Yes. Um, yes, we'll figure out a way to get it to you. Um, this recording will also be on the Tableau user group YouTube page and I'll be sure to share that link out um on the linkedin page and wherever else i can find it so keep an eye out um we'll figure out uh yeah how to get that info to you and and look forward to staying in touch with all you all and if you have any questions about slalom or um see any use cases for this work please reach out let us know and be happy to chat further very good thanks carl thank you everyone thank you everyone see ya thanks guys bye bye